this land is mine God gave this land to me this brave and ancient land to me <laughs> now it's important that I begin with a disclaimer if I'm going to speak about globalists, Satanists, Hillary Clinton, and world nationalists, and taking over the world and their collective unconscious and psychology and whatnot, this is not a endorsement of any particular political scenarios. This is more a general understanding of, <laughs> of the architecture of psychology. So when we get to the point where we talk about how on Mars, Satan lives there. On Saturn, he is there and he's communicating with the CIA through DMT. That's simply me articulating something that Jung said. It's not my own thoughts. So, w without further ado, I I'm going to crack right into it. So our vision, our conception of ourself as an individual, as a separate and unique person, is most certainly based on some very reliable evidence, such as the fact that I don't feel like I'm every other boyo in the world. I feel like I'm most certainly myself. My experience happens to me when I wake up in the morning. I do not wake up in someone else's bed. I tend to wake up in my own bed, in my own reality, my own position. But this is quite a persistent delusion because Despite being an individual, despite having this individual experience, I am not alone. None of us are. And what we consider ourselves is a difficult problem. Though all I see and touch is changing, the eye within that watches stays the same. Now, pay attention to your experience right now. We're going to do a bit of a boil meditation classes, some guided meditation. I'm going to bring you to your cave. Pay attention to what witnesses the world, the thing that you sort of call you. Visualize it like you were in a movie theater and you were sitting down in the seat and that's you and you're quiet and you don't talk and you're watching, you're a witness, you are not a participant, you're not on the screen, you are not on the stage. Now what is on the screen and on the stage is made up of your sense experiences. Outside, when you open your eyes, you see the world, you might see that giant poster on the wall of a mountain with a kingdom on top and solar boy rising out of it into the endless vista of space. And that's what you see on your screen, but that is not you. And you, we know this, this is an obvious thing. But let's move this back into the realm of our thoughts. Because when we see this movie metaphor, when we see ourselves as sitting in the pews in a cinema, we notice that not only is the outside world not what watches, but our thoughts are the same. This voice that you're hearing, which is me, just a, just a spoiler alert there, the voices that happen inside your head are also not you. Now, this is some very, very strange phenomenon about the human experience. You are not the only one inside your mind. There are other thoughts that come to you. Now, when a memory flashes up on the screen that has some sort of emotional effect on you, you will experience a feeling. Say you did something cringy when you were younger and embarrassed yourself or something like that. What is somewhat interesting is that, and this would be quite Buddhist, is that you can remove yourself even from the emotion and make the emotion something separate from the witness. And once you start doing this, you can start asking some extremely strange and serious questions. Where do these thoughts come from? And why am I not them? Because we walk around thinking, I am my emotions, I am my memory, I am my thoughts. But we're clearly not. Now, if you do this meditation properly, you can find yourself sitting there as the witness inside the cinema, 
noticing that almost everything appearing on the screen that you previously considered you, that you got caught up in, you got engaged, you got sucked into the movie, the plotline, the story, is not you. You can throw your popcorn off your lap and ask yourself a serious question. Where are these thoughts coming from? And so you will get up on your seat and you'll spin around and you'll look around the room and then you'll see the projector at the back of the room where these thoughts seem to be getting projected from, that little beam of light that makes the movie run. And so you'll say to yourself, wait a second. What the hell is that? Because that's not me. Is that my deep memory? Is that my deep mind? What the hell is going on in there? Who controls that thing? Why am I seeing what I am seeing? This is very, very strange. And it most certainly is, because any honest experience of your emotions is that you don't really decide what you think as much as you'd like to think. If you get caught up in social media, your mind will be pulled around like a matador pulling around a bull as you're paying attention to whatever your content creators are popping up on the social media. And you may think you'll be able to free yourself from social media, which is most certainly a good thing, because you get sucked up into that, that movie. But then you pull yourself back, you're not even free from your thoughts. Your thoughts keep on just churning out memories and ideas. And you sit down and you do something like meditation, and there's all these little niggling voices and pains and, and confusions and, and stories and ideas. And it's very hard for you, the witness, just to detach from everything and sit there and maybe light a cigarette in the cinema and tell everyone to go fuck themselves. That's quite hard for you to do. Now, the reason why this is relevant is because it puts a intense existential question in our minds. We realize that I think therefore I am ain't so obvious on deeper inspection because what we think is not me. So what is it? Now, of course, you could say it's something like your memories, but there's more to it. People teach us what to think. Your thoughts about what is right and wrong, your behavior, all of this stuff comes from your family telling you your whole life what is right and wrong, conditioning you, as they say, with behavioral cues like you're a little animal. And that's now controlled what emotions you attach to certain stories, which dictates how you behave, because emotions drive behavior. Stories through emotions drive behavior. This becomes scary and fascinating because you realize that you're not you. The thing that you built this whole reality around, this personality, persona, this character that you are, and your belief in right and wrong, and your belief in what's moral and what's good and what you're fighting for and what you're aiming for, and your career, many of these decisions were not even you. They were put into your mind by advice from other people, perhaps even judgment and scolding by other people. Now, what are you to make about this? Because thinking you're an individual with your own unique perspective, thoughts that you've all rationally created and shaped with no influence from the outside world does not seem very true at all. Now, this is important because this is a fatalistic thing that you must accept. We wish we were these unique, free individuals. And there's most certainly credence towards doing exercises like meditation and philosophy and challenging all your beliefs and drilling them down to their first principles. But you live in an existential problem where you're never going to be able to perfect yourself. That is not possible. You'll never be able to get everything perfectly shaped out without an immense amount of work. And perhaps brilliant people might achieve this over an extended period of time. But you need to, on some level, embrace the influence of the collective. And why might you say, well, think of it this way. You could have sat down perhaps in 1910 and said to yourself, Oh my God, we're moving towards war. 
But there's a serious problem that many people around about 1910, perhaps even in the 19th century, predicted that there would be great wars. But something tragic was happening where there was a momentum towards these wars. It was like a tide in an ocean. And despite the fact that these people could talk about it, despite the fact that they could predict and see, they could not stop it. The collective had to do what it was doing. The tide was carrying history towards those great events. And so you as an individual have an awful, awful problem because you could enlighten many individuals and most certainly you, you could influence history in an immense way. But on some level, you need to get used to the idea that you're never going to be able to control it completely. You must look at what you're doing, not as I am going to split the ocean open like Moses. I'm sorry to say, but most of us just do not have that type of power. Instead, what is going to happen to you is you're going to be faced with a tide, worse, perhaps a wave. And it could crush you if you're not prepared. And perhaps your only real play is to learn to surf. Because most get crushed in the tide. A war is a horrible thing. There's little you could have told a young man growing up in 1910 that would have saved him from getting conscripted into the army. What are you going to do? Tell him to run away? His entire community would have shamed him as a coward. The collective was moving towards war. The emotional principles of it is honorable to fight for your country, it is dishonorable to run away from the war, no matter the cause, was forcing many of these men towards what you could argue is a pointless death. Now I talk about such bleak black pills because we need to develop a gravitas around these ideas. These tides are monstrous. These collective movements are huge, are bigger than us. The only correct emotional way to understand them is something like destiny. Your place in history is not unique. It is not special. You were part of this entire chain of events, chain of emotions, of movements, of sequences that lead up to your very reality. These things are inescapable. This is your moment on the stage. This is what's happening to you. And many people preach that you should run from this. You should not participate in these collective tides. And perhaps they are right. Perhaps the monastics, the Buddhists, the Gnostics, perhaps they are right. But if we are going to speak practically about how you're going to live your life, the vast majority of people are going to have to engage with the chaos. And I certainly mean it's a chaos. You and I do not get to control this collective tide. It is as autonomous as the ocean, and it moves. It has a strange life of its own. And if you want proof of this, just go talk to someone out there. Go talk to someone and you'll see how the vast majority of their thoughts have been picked up from the news, picked up from the internet, picked up from what their friends tell them is the right way to think. And then you go talk to their friends and you realize that their friends are just passing on what they have had reinforced. And this becomes a very strange and difficult problem because who's in control? Now, there most certainly could be controllers. Something like the Catholic Church, they were like a giant boat with a couple of wise boyos with big long beards and giant paddles stirring up the ocean to get more out of these tides to dictate which way these tides were going. And they most certainly had a profound and massive influence. And this is what you could call the leaders of the world. And we most certainly have some now. But the Catholic Church did not dominate this tide. Things like the Protestant and the Reformation show you that they are not immune to the destiny 
of the ocean, of the collective. There are some things that are completely out of our grasp. And that's a very unsettling idea. Because if no one's in control, what the hell is going on? And I'm not going to be able to answer that question. I am merely a boyo. But what I will be able to discuss is how we could analyze this ocean. Pay attention to the patterns present in this ocean that may allow us to make better predictions about where things go and what is coming. You might know of the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic Ocean that keeps Ireland warm. I don't know who the fuck came up with that notion, but that's that's what they say. That's science for you. <laughs> the Gulf Stream is warm water that comes out of the Caribbean islands and flows up to the west coast of Ireland and actually keeps it temperate, whereas in the continent, the continent gets frozen. And this giant tidal pattern dictates the weather in Ireland. It's a very, very confusing thing. But we can think of these patterns in ocean flows as determined the Gulf Stream exists and it is going to dictate the weather vastly and it's something that's hard to see when you look out into the ocean at first you go out to Galway onto the west of Ireland and you look out and you say well I can't see any Gulf Stream it just looks like a load of water and somewhat similar you could visualize something like an archetype Something that's very, very difficult to see or understand. But it is a pattern, a hidden movement, a hidden shape that forces things to go a certain way. Only instead of tides, what we are analyzing is emotions. Emotions are the wave. Emotions are the drivers of movement. And this is a very, very difficult thing to understand on a massive scale. But it is essential. You can take your individual experience and what we call extrapolate out conclusions for what drives your emotions. For example, you want to know why you are fighting and why you are suffering. What are you fighting for? What is the point of this job? What is the point of this great endeavor I'm participating in? What is our great project? And as I've mentioned plenty of times before, the answers to that question currently are so poor that there's many people committing suicide. Now you, you individual, you boyo, you say to yourself, I'm going to go to this office. I'm going to do this job. And it's going to cost me the most valuable resource I will ever get. My time. Something I cannot have back. My life is like a fuse that burns down. And each day I get this little bit of flame, this little bit of energy, this little bit of ion from this burning fuse. And I never get it back. And when the fuse is burnt out, the show's over. And so obviously we attach a lot of value to that little bit of life energy that we have. And it hurts. Nothing hurts so much as knowing that you're putting in effort towards something that is a waste. Now, if you live in our world, and we can start looking at the collective dream, and this is how the collective is relevant to something as intimate as the suffering you feel at 4 p.m. on a workday. If you think about your world and you see this office job is contributing towards the system, the game, and then you ask yourself, this system that I'm participating in is scouring the oceans, is ripping apart and burning the rainforests, is dishonoring the poor, is trying to destroy white Western culture. You'll have an unbelievable amount of cognitive dissonance. Your little daily fuse of your finite time is contributing towards these evil plans. And so you become unemployed <laughs> as an act of profound rebellion. Yes, yes, I understand you. Do not worry. You are on a spiritual quest. As Christ said, the neat shall inherit the earth. 
Now, what is important to understand is what I am pointing to here is a psychological requirement. You need to have belief in the collective project that you are engaging in. That pattern, that word, that concept, that category, the collective project, is what I would call an archetype, which I call the kingdom. Yes, I've done it again. I have both invented and simultaneously discovered an archetype. I am the Oroboyo. Now, the reason why I call this an archetype a superordinate pattern is because everybody needs an answer to that question. Why am I working? Why am I suffering? What is this collective project that I'm engaged in? Now, depending on the time in history that you exist in, you will get a different answer. If you lived in Judea, they would have told you about the coming kingdom of heaven. If you lived in Rome, well, they would have said Rome. And this becomes extremely serious, because when you were going to leave to war, to die for your nation, and your community was shaming you, pressuring you into do this, and your honor was speaking to you, being like, you, you have to go do it. You can't be a coward. You would have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to die for? And I would say, die for England, die for Germany, die for France. That's your kingdom. What is that? Well, you read through the accounts from World War I, people like Ernst the Younger, and you notice that despite the chaos, the horror of these wars were for people, these were the trenches, he describes these moments of lucid awareness where he would dream, he would imagine Germany, he'd imagine the meadow fields, he'd imagine his friends, he'd imagine the beautiful girls, he'd imagine beer, he'd imagine the town, the sun is shining, and he would say to himself, this is what I'm fighting for, this is worth dying for. Because through this dream, through this understanding of his community, the felt experience of his family, his friends, his people. He connects to a larger idea, which is the great project that Germany was engaging on at that point, which was creating the German nation. Germany was not a nation before 1870, around about when Nietzsche started writing. And so they gathered together in this collective ideal of this is Germany, this is us, this is what we are. And that's very, very abstract. Some people can't really feel that. But you can most certainly feel and remember and experience in your mind, in your dreams, your family. And these are all connected in this giant concept of the kingdom. And what is scary about this is the kingdom of Germany was clashing against the kingdom of France and England for the position of power on the continent. And so each and every soldier is participating in this giant war of ideas, these two states combating each other. But they can't see that. Instead, they're getting a sliver, a glimpse into that through their personal experiences. It's a very, very strange phenomenon. Because the war of super states, Rome moving across the world, is most certainly present and matters and happens. But the individual experience of that war is profoundly low resolution. Most people participating in history do not know what's actually happening. They can't see it on a clear, lucid level as they watch political movements move across maps. Most people don't see it that way. Most people experience it in a very down-to-earth, day-to-day experience. And this is the same idea as the tide moves the waves, and you might see the waves, and you might ask very personal questions about, how do I get on that wave? But that does not mean that you understand the tide that is moving everything. But the tide most certainly sets the agenda. So what I want to drill home here with the severest of gravitas is this kingdom, this notion, this idea is presented to us merely as a dream, as a vision. Sometimes we don't even get the whole dream. 
And this dream gives us our identity. And this dream is so powerful that it can send us into war and have us willingly die for it. Now, if you want to think in terms of evolution, communities organize, and it's very difficult for an individual to conceptualize the community properly. So what would happen is a dream would arise out of the community that would say, this is who we are. And that gives each individual an identity within that community. I am Irish. We are all Irish. That is the one thing that unites us. We have a shared history and a shared gene pool, most importantly. And you'll find that most of these nations, most of these gene pools have DNA sharing them. The World War I nations were most certainly fighting as tribes against each other. Now, this is most certainly not the only way these collectives manifest. Christianity is a very interesting one in that it is not a genetic unity. That being said, Europe is a genetic unity. And for most of history, Europe was considered Christian. So Christianity was matched with the concept of genetics. But it is not exclusive to that. Modern Christianity is far more of a world, global religion, a global collective, a global identity. So all that is to say, the reason why someone would die for an idea, like a kingdom, like an identity, such as I am Irish, I am Christian, has a genetic reason. If I die for the sake of my tribe, my tribe lives on, my genetics pass themselves on in a very indirect way. This is the great sacrifice of the soldier. So this kingdom, this pattern, it is empty. It is built into human nature. It is an empty slot. And we must fill it with a dream, with a story. And that will program the human being, if I'm to be robotic. It will program the human being's emotions towards what they will do something as insane as die for, as expend all their life energy on creating. This kingdom, this dream, this is not trivial. It is possibly the biggest and most important thing you could ever imagine. So if you and I were to ask ourselves some interesting questions, if this dream is simply a story and placed into our minds through education, through reinforcement by the community and through shared stories, which of these dreams is correct? That is the postmodern question par excellence. Now, my proposition, and I know I'm getting radical considering I only discovered an archetype moments ago. My proposition is that we can take a mathematical approach to this. There is an architecture to the way that we structure our beliefs that is independent of our beliefs. This is these slots I'm talking about. This is these shapes I'm talking about. This is these geometries I'm talking about. It's very, very abstract. People will not get it. So I am going to offer visualizations to show. Everybody has that slot, that kingdom. Everybody has that space where they need a story to be put into it. If you put in a story that you are a German and the story of Germany is this set of myths and history, your identity will become German and then you will fight for Germany. This is not something trivial. It is almost genetic. It needs to be on that level. You cannot, you cannot become Irish without having your ancestors go through the famine. That is part of our identity. To be an Irish person, a big challenge emotionally for me is to digest the fact that we were slaves for a thousand years to the English. I need to digest that fact and also digest the unbelievable horror that was the famine, the essentially the genocide of our people that destroyed our nation. It bled it out pretty much. I need to look towards the English who were in many senses responsible for that. And I need to read some Nietzsche and understand how Nietzsche says resentment, resentment towards creators, towards masters 
is a very, very unhealthy thing. And I need to look to the English and understand the tragedy of what happened and their role in that, and then learn to get over it. And that emotional experience is incredibly difficult. It's an incredibly difficult thing to talk with the Irish people about. This is a bitter hate that we have towards that experience. But then the English people I encounter have a bitter shame over that experience. And I do not like seeing the English people shamed. I do not like seeing them lacking their confidence. I do not like seeing them sheepish towards me. I most certainly do not want them to genocide me again. But I would, I almost feel like a brother towards them. And I would like to say, fuck you, let's move on. That is a collective part of my unconscious that I need to bring to consciousness and it is incredibly emotional char emotionally charged and it is tied viciously to my identity and I need to master it and conquer it and understand and storytell around it to heal the wound. I am traumatized by the famine. I am traumatized by a thousand years of slavery. And it is, not, it is not straightforward how I deal with that. And no one else, the, the English cannot understand what I need to go through. The French cannot understand what I need to go through. The Germans cannot understand what I need to go through. No one in the world can ever understand that Irish experience. It is unique. It is mine. It is part of my identity. It is part of the genetic identity that I have inherited. I cannot escape that. Now, what's so important to understand with that is that I am at war with that. It is my conquest over this that will determine my future. Now, this war is incredibly sophisticated and difficult because to be a conquered people for a thousand years, to be slaves, is not a good thing. You don't want to think that way. I have genetics. That's what I am. I am made up of a set of DNA. And I ask myself, well, what am I capable of? Can I become great? And then when I look back through my history, I see that I lost. My people lost. Does that mean that my people are not good enough? Now, of course, I can say, oh, those British were oppressors. They were tyrants. But if I'm to take a Nietzschean view of this and say that the world is fair game, it is a game of chess, and losers lose because they're not good enough, not because they're nice and innocent and noble and moral. And so I must ask myself, my, my failure, my, my people's failure in response to the English problem was our lack of organization, skill, military organization and whatnot. It was our fault. There is no way around that. I must own the loss and move on. And that is so hard because I have to tie into my identity. We lost. Does that mean I am a perpetual loser? Does that mean that we are destined to lose forever? And that emotional war, that mindset war, changes your soul. Because if I can get over that and say, yes, we lost in the past, but we are here to bounce back better and stronger than ever, like a fighter, like a fighter, like Conor McGregor, who goes out and loses to Nate Diaz, a better competitor. Conor could have bitched about Nate Diaz, but instead he goes and he fights him again, and he beats him, and he comes back stronger and better. He had the correct mindset, a winner's mindset. No excuses. This is what I need to do with my story. And no one can feel that in the way I feel that. That is mine. That is unique. And if I achieve that, I achieve a spiritual victory that sets me free from the hardest thing to release yourself from. The belief that you are a victim and the belief that your trauma defines you and you cannot be healed. That is my unique challenge, my unique journey. And I feel I can beat it. And as unbelievably rich the Irish story is, I would speak to a Ukrainian and they would tell me of the Holodomor. And they've gone through something like that. And I can never feel the Holodomor, nor understand how they relate to Russians. 
but they're going through a similar challenge to me. I can talk to a Jew, and a Jew will tell me about the Holocaust. Or I talk to a black African, and they tell me about slavery. And I meet many of the same patterns that I went through. But I can't know what it feels like. That collective story is unique to them. Now, the reason why I speak of psychological architecture and geometry is because our kingdoms are built on these stories. And we are always trying to move towards heaven and move away from hell. And hell is an abstraction. Heaven is an abstraction. And so in order for us to articulate what we're moving away from, we need to paint a picture onto hell. For the Irish, the famine was hell. When we dream in our minds, in our secret moments, about the worst time when everything went wrong, we see people starving. We see those pictures that we saw from youth and we hear those stories our grandparents told us. Then when we ask ourselves, what we are we moving towards? Well, we say to ourselves, who is the demon? Who is Satan underneath that dream? Who was causing it? And that was the English. And so our heaven, our right, our moving towards God's will to make us free and liberal. Our new kingdom became the Irish nation. And that dream began to boil up in the Irish people. Free, independent nation became the goal. And after the famine, it was nearly inevitable. Because once we had that scar, the anger was so intense that we were going to force it into reality. Hence, we had all those wars. This exact same architecture is present in the Jews. The Jews wandered through history in their fallen state, in their status quo, in their diaspora, as they know it. And they were searching for heaven, for an ideal utopian kingdom in the future. And once the Holocaust happened, that propelled them with energy away from that evil, with Hitler sitting there at the bottom, away from that evil towards Israel, the political achievement of their biblical dream. Yahweh promised the kingdom, and they received it due to their diligence, due to their 2,000-year-long obedience. This architecture is universal. It's fascinating how this manifests cross-culturally. Because if you are a victim or a loser, like the Irish or like the Jews, your identity is somewhat negatively premised. And so at the very hell, when you look into hell, you see something that happened to you that hurt you. You see a tragedy, a pain, a, uh, an injustice, and that motivates you towards your heaven. And what's interesting is when you look at people who were aggressors and don't understand themselves as innocent victims, people like the English, like the Germans. The Germans, for example, most certainly had terrible things happen to them during the 20th century, but their identity is entirely premised on guilt, on the guilt of what they did. Their hell is tied up with what happened to the Jews. And their Satan is Hitler. And so the kingdom they are moving towards is premised on all those values and all those taboos. Their kingdom that they want to create is a reaction to what they did. If you model the consciousness of the English, fascinatingly, these were the people who stopped the Holocaust, as we understand it. But still, they see themselves as guilty for something. Because, of course, Auschwitz is not in their hell, and Hitler is not at the root, but colonialism is. And the Irish genocide is the most local representation of that. And so, as I said, when I speak to English people, they feel awful for what happened. They apologize for what happened. They feel deep shame. And it's a very strange experience. 
Because I, a slave nation, a wounded nation, a victim, I have to come to terms with the tragedy of failure, with the emotional trauma of not being good enough. Yet the English go through a similar trauma, a similar struggle with not being good enough. Only their not being good enough is that we ourselves were evil. And there's unbelievable dangers with everything on both sides of this. Because if you were motivated off unconscious, charged stories of pain, you don't make rational decisions. If I allow my trauma as a slave nation to define me, I will stop believing in myself and I will become a failure. But likewise with the British, if they don't process the emotion, how mad would they go in an attempt to get catharsis for what they did? Now, despite me saying that I am not coming at this from a political angle, I am looking at this psychologically, like I am studying patience, only this time it's collective people. The resolution of these tensions determines history. The choice a collective makes is largely predicated on these stories, these emotions. Now I'm going to leave these questions open-ended. They are incredibly complex. I do not know how all of this interacts and plays out. How all of these tides mash together to determine our destiny and our history. But I will say that you can take your nation and use this geometry, this architecture of psychology to map out the reality, the dream, the story you live in and ask some very interesting questions. What is the heaven we're going through? Is it a positively defined heaven? Is it a reactionary heaven? Do you think your people, your collective, you, do you think you're struggling with shame? Do you think you have a victim complex? Do you think you have a guilty complex? Now, moving out of the realm of nations, Let's talk about how something that is not a people can have a collective identity. For example, Christianity, in its very schizophrenic way, can not only be race, but it can also be a universal identity. It was actually largely the premise of the religion before it became European. Communism is a fascinating identity because it is not race-based, as most nations are. Instead, it is class-based. It is somewhat of a reactionary identity against the idea of royalty, of aristocracy, of bourgeoisie, of the upper class. So, in the fallen state that we all find ourselves in, that we're looking for a justification, a reason, something to fight for, to get us out of this tragedy. As a working class person, a lower class person, especially back in the days before we had a vast amount of wealth, starvation would be a present memory in your consciousness. Many people in Russia lived in feudal hardship and starved and Things like the world wars just seemed ridiculous. They seemed like they were class wars over rich aristocratic elites literally spending the lives of the lower classes to jostle over territorial markers. It seemed like a ridiculous project to engage in. And this collective trauma and energy boiled up within the consciousness of Europe all around Germany, there were communist revolutions. There was this huge problem in the trenches where the French themselves were turning communist. The attitude in the war was that it was not Germany and France and England and Russia versus each other because the, only the people who were fighting were the working class, so they felt. Instead, the energy, the vibe, the tone of that war was actually a rising consciousness that it was the working class versus these deluded upper class gentry who were just sick in the head. 
The communist revolution happened during that war. And so that great trauma of how they treat the lower classes became that resentful energy that they projected at the bourgeoisie, symbolized satanically as the Romanov family in Russia. And hence the Romanov family got murdered. The kingdom that was promised was that utopia. Equality, communal living, the shared means of production. And as Marx said, a liberty from their chains. Now, this is very interesting because it coincides with the consciousness present in the French Revolution. Liberty from and oppressor. Likewise, the Irish were seeking liberty from their oppressors. Now, what is extremely interesting about these three examples is that they share the same architecture and the consequence of these revolutions was a bloodbath. The Irish descended into a civil war. The French had their guillotines and the Bolshevik revolution was a sickening bloodbath. Now, what you hear from people who are more religious minded, and this is a great, great positive assertion for Christianity is that Christ abstracts the utopian kingdom into the afterlife. It's a reward God gives you. And it's related to the idea of the kingdom of God is within. So if you get rid of that resentment you have towards the bourgeoisie, you won't need to rebel. And you won't have to engage in these ridiculous bloodbaths that happen from failed utopias. And the whole concept behind that is Christ was God. And he came down to prove to you that this is how you will get salvation. Because you're trapped by your psychology. By your need to participate in some type of war for a kingdom. You are fatally stuck in your destiny, trying to find the kingdom that will end your suffering. That is your existential crisis. And you will go for any utopia that sounds sexy and romantic enough. And it will always, always end in blood. And Christ says, let your resentment and your guilt be projected onto me. Look what happened to me. And he, down there in hell, is on the cross. And all around, the Satan, the demons, are his apostles who lost their courage. The Romans who were indifferent to the strangulation of God. The Jewish Pharisees who wanted to kill him so they could preserve their hope for their utopia. This is the immense value of religion, which we cannot brush aside anymore. It has the ability to psychologically heal you from these tragedies, be it your victimhood, because of course Christ was a victim, or your guilt and shame, because of course the crucifixion is the ultimate form of guilt. It is an incredible tool for catharsis. It is an incredible tool to free you from these dangers latent and irrationalities latent within your collective conscience. And I would, of course, love to leave you at that and offer you a neat solution. But there is, of course, the ever present specter of Nietzsche with a different view. Because there's a way of seeing the world known as the master's understanding, the person with a good conscience. And I don't think Nietzsche's contributions are trivial. He helped me immensely deal with the Irish struggle. He helped me immensely reframe my trauma as something I can overcome better than anybody else. Now, the core of that was him being realistic about the nature of reality. Each and every one of these kingdoms, these geometrical models, 
has at the top of it a first principle, which we essentially should call God. So at the very top of this tree of life, you have a belief in what God, the creator of the game, wants his kingdom to be. Essentially the rules of the game. As I said before, there is a logos in music. There is a set of harmonic principles in music that if you obey them, you will make a good song. And so you could look at each and every society as a genre of music manifesting those principles in their own specific way. Each and every kingdom is an attempt to reach those principles. So every kingdom that I've described so far has a assertion as to what those principles are. The French, the communists and the Irish all say that God wants you to be free. God wants you to be equal. Christianity, in some sense, says the same. The idea is that God made the world so that you are free and unique and it's somewhat of a testing ground for your experience. Now the genius and the difficulty of Nietzsche is his assertion that that belief that God wants these set of first principles is highly optimistic, perhaps even delusional. Because when you observe nature, and we can only assume that God made nature, God created the game the way he wanted it to be. You don't live in some accident. If your God is a genius, well, he didn't accidentally make nature evil, did he? Nature is the way God wants it to be. And if you observe nature, nature is not a fan of equality. Nature does not save the gazelles from the lions. Nature instead rewards the lions with health and power when the lion hunts down the weakest gazelle and bites its neck and chokes it to death and then eats it perhaps even while it's still breathing. Nature has a twisted sense of liberty, freedom and equality. Nietzsche was suggesting that all of these kingdoms that we have created, all of these collective identities that we have created that seem so prominent in the world now may be wrong at their first principles. That's an unbelievably difficult idea. Now, if we observe nature precisely the way she acts and try to deduct the logos or the rules present within nature, we see that she is radically in favor of inequality. Now, in order to understand this, we need to actually go back to the, the conception of evil. Because all of those previous evils, all of those previous kingdoms, suggest that evil is the oppressor. But this conception of evil is different. And this would be a very Roman way of understanding the world. The world has this force in physics known as entropy. Entropy is related to the idea of equilibrium. When a system goes to neutral, like when the heart monitor stops having up and down, instead it just goes flat. What does that mean? That means death. Equilibrium is equality. And there's this strange phenomenon where Time is pushing us further and further towards entropy. And the unbelievably strange phenomenon of the world is life. Life is anti-entropic. Life fights against entropy. Life fights against death. Entropy is always trying to pull down what is great. As you see, you will build a beautiful city, but time will have its way and chew it up. You will build a beautiful body, but eventually you will get old. There's this force in this world almost like a being that has a desire to pull everything back to neutral. And there's a very strange counter force, which is what we are. We fight against that. We try to beat that. There's this constant struggle 
towards higher, more powerful, more beautiful, more successful. And so the murder of the gazelle by the lion is good because the food that supplies the lion with energy makes the lion more resistant to death. And that's nature's savage conception of right and wrong. And from that premise, the greatest guilt we can have, the greatest evil, the hell, is when we allow entropy to creep in and pull down our great kingdoms, be it the body that we create, if we allow bad habits to creep in and we start to decay as a person and we fall apart and then we lose our health and eventually we die. That is no different than the lack of proper organization in an empire like Rome that eventually causes it to fall, it causes it to decay towards the forces of entropy. And so right there at the bottom, Satan is some type of spiritual creature, entropy, death, constant decay, and that is our war. And so we, our utopia, something that we can never quite achieve, is our constant striving upwards towards something more powerful, beauty, and resilient towards the forces of entropy. And of course, this is interesting because people will hear this and say, that is so evil, but we are not saying that we should go out and torture gazelles, but simply observing the fact that our entire existence is premised off the suffering of others. Animals suffer immensely so that we can eat. In fact, according to this worldview, the unnecessary suffering we put animals through is quite ridiculous when it would probably be smarter to raise them healthily so that their meat gives us optimum health instead of these crazy, ugly, dirty, entropic factory farms that are an attempt to feed, interestingly, the equality-loving democratic market. Now, the usual nonsense you get when you bring up Nietzsche is people project onto it the idea that he is evil, that he is proposing some type of anti-moral, cruel world where you murder everybody and then that's victory or something like that. The correct way for you to visualize what this master morality would look like is to watch the movie Gladiator. Gladiator was set at Rome's peak, where Marcus Aurelius stood as the greatest empire of them all. And he needed to pass on the torch of responsibility, because this is actually the root of master morality. You have cultivated something brilliant, and now you're responsible for keeping it alive. You build a body, and now you're responsible for pushing it higher to more extremes, to higher performances, more life, more victory, grander, bigger, and also preserving that against the evil forces of entropy, which is represented as Commodus, the narcissistic, self-obsessed, self-absorbed, evil man, the bad man who doesn't believe in justice. And he destroys the empire. He is the force of entropy. He even looks death-like. And Maximus, the proud warrior, is in fact the symbol of the just man, the noble warrior, the noble man. So what I want you to see, what I want you to notice is less so the stories, but more so the architecture, the mathematics of psychology that is universal among all these stories. And we could start asking ourselves some interesting questions because people get very, very caught up on the absolute truth of their specific story. Take what it means to be Irish. I posit God as saying to me, he wants my liberty as an absolute truth. That's what he wants. He wants me to be free and equal. And hey, that could be true. But nonetheless, this is the postmodern problem. We can see how this could be a subjective decision based on me being Irish. And so I could posit the English as the enemies of God. And therefore, my liberty becomes good and they become evil and it is absolutely good and absolutely evil which is fighting 
But how do I then square that with the concept of communism, which is looking for liberty over in Russia? And their genocide of the bourgeoisie, does that mean... Does that mean such behavior was good? Because they were breaking free from oppression themselves. These things are difficult, and the struggles of nations, especially in the modern world, get integrated into super struggles, super collective dreams. As we said, every nation, every tribe in Europe has its identity, has its communal kingdom, its communal victory, it's looking for the Irish, the English, the French, but something like the Catholic Church, the universal church as it's known, can absorb all of those into a superordinate empire known as Christendom. Likewise, something like communism is a bigger idea than the collective nation, than the race, and so it can integrate all the races, the nations, into its ideal equality. Now, what's interesting is this stuff is extremely sloppy because over in communist Russia, when World War II kicked off, Stalin found that he couldn't appeal to the communist ideal of the equal kingdom when fighting Nazi Germany. The people did not have the spirit to fight. That propaganda was not working. And so he very quickly went back to nationalism and metaphors of Napoleon and collective struggles and stories of the Russian people. And that motivated them successfully. He abandoned what worked to get the revolution and moved towards a somewhat collection of nations all operating under the giant wing of communism. And from observing all those kingdoms, we can then deduce our dream. Because we live in the liberal West. Now, we are engaging in a fascinating project, which is globalization. The concept underneath globalization is that we are entering in a conception of race where we don't necessarily have nations, but we instead are a giant collective of people. In order to unite larger amounts of people, the stories need to get bigger. The liberal West came to define itself in opposition to communism the capitalist West. Western liberal capitalism, having won that debate with communism, has now inherited the right to stand as the superordinate ideology for creating the global world, the same way as Christianity stood as the united worldview over Europe. Now, if we were to use this geometry of psychology, these archetypes, these super patterns, to help us understand where we find ourselves as a collective, it should be able to allow us to make reasonable predictions about where our heads are at somewhat unconsciously and what the trends or energies may be pointing us towards in the future. All of the discontent you see right now is squarely pointed at the liberal Western conception of capitalism. Yes, capitalism did make us rich. Yes, it provided us with an immense amount of freedom. But it's going to chew up the Amazon and spit it back out as mulch. Yes, capitalism did give us a huge amount of products in our supermarket, but that came at the expense of industry all around the world. And those people who worked in those factories, who come from those third world countries, they were a little bit pissed off that they had to be the ones slaving away. In their story, it's their turn to come and inherit and reap the harvest for capitalism. And of course, if everyone is equal, who is the West to say no to them? And consequently, and this is not trivial, capitalism in integrating us into this new collective identity, 
this new collective story where we are all individuals on this earth, sharing in the abundant joys of the free market. Well, this collective sets the cultural agenda at the expense of the traditional agenda. Here in Ireland, we have become a lot more Americanized. This is present all over Europe. This is present all over the world. That Red Hot Chili Pepper song, Californication, is a lament of that. The free movement of people erodes the collective identity of the nations, and then people react aggressively against that. Because capitalism, despite its material abundance, does not offer people a strong replacement identity. How are you to go from Irish or English or French or German, where you have a rich traditional history, a strong identity, a strong spirit, a strong collective that you can connect with, to a worker bee in a giant grey city where everything is the same, everything is commoditized, everybody drinks Starbucks, everybody listens to the same music, and there's no higher goal apart from extending the reach of capitalism through technology or politics. Now, this is an extremely serious psychological problem, and I'm not coming here as saying I understand advanced politics or economics, I'm sticking strictly with psychology, but if you look at the fact that so many people are opiating themselves or killing themselves, well, we can only point to our dominant ideology as the root cause. There's something not quite right. And when there's something not quite right, people suffer. As I said, people work these jobs and hate that there's no point. If I participate in capitalism, I'm destroying the Amazon. If I participate in capitalism, I'm destroying my nation's native culture. These are both legitimate and serious criticisms. And when they are not addressed correctly, they boil up into a blunt emotion like resentment and cause people to turn against the system. So if we were to talk about our position in history and the tide that we are currently moving on and asking ourselves some extremely difficult questions without moralizing, without saying to ourselves, oh, those socialists on the left are playing identity politics, or those right-wingers getting into nationalism and ethnic identity, or even many of the centrists who see that massive resentment often ends in genocide for the status quo, and so we're quite frightened about giving in. Instead, we can see that the world order, the Christendom of our age, the status quo, the superordinate ideology, the big story, is running on empty. It has pretty much achieved its world victory, and people are not happy. People are alienated, isolated, and disenfranchised. Now, the reason why people might be so pissed is because capitalism promised them Happiness would come from abundance. And now that we have abundance, we are not happy. The kingdom, the heaven that we were reaching for was material. And we got it. And like King Midas, it's turning into ash. To use a capitalist term, we're getting buyer's remorse. Now, if I was to make a proposition psychologically as a solution to this very drastic problem, and I am just a boyo, I am no prophet, I am just suggesting, what if we created a more positive and intelligent proposition for a kingdom? The psychological ignorance of suggesting that abundance would make you happy is incomprehensible, but not surprising considering how we are apes. Now, the danger about critiquing your world order is the same as the danger of critiquing Christianity when you lived in Christendom. 
they proposed Christ as the ultimate God. They did not tolerate heresy very well. Now, as much as we like to say we are tolerant people, we know from psychology that it has not changed. Human nature remains consistent despite ideology. And critiquing the liberty, fraternity, and equality that runs through communism, nationalism, capitalism, all of the isms of the last 500 years is very, very dangerous. But there is a very serious thing we have to contemplate. Making the collective project an identity all about using the free market to serve the average individual as essentially divine and God, the entire focal point of all our work and our ideals, has the deep and dark shadow side of turning every person into a meaningless atom with no defining character other than their will to consume. Now that we've run this program, we realize that the only way you can have an identity is by buying clothes that looks like a certain celebrity. You only have an identity based on the music you listen to. There's nothing inherent about you that we hold up as superordinate. It's not difficult to understand why this is wrong. Go back to our very first conception at the start of this talk. You make the mistake of thinking that you are your thoughts. I think, therefore, I am. But in truth, you are much more a silent, strange soul or witness. And the thoughts that run by you often come from other people. So this strange idea that the consumer is this unified entity that is rational and consistent and makes all these rational and consistent thoughts is psychologically incorrect. To be a consumer, to rely on consumerism bringing out the best world possible, is to think that people's minds are not infected with lower desires, marketing, advertising, bullshit. Now, if we were to take the proposition that excellence could replace that and suggest that the ideal individual would be closer to something like the Renaissance man, a meme we understand well, a person who has been crafted as the ultimate representation of the civilized person. This is what our whole effort goes towards, not turning everyone into a consumer and then bowing down to that consumerism, but instead saying, how do we cultivate brilliance? How do we cultivate the best out of people? How do we take all these individuals and try our best to make as many of them great as possible? What type of kingdom could we expect to appear? The high art of the Renaissance stands Olympian in its grandeur compared to the bananas we tape to our walls nowadays. The defining feature of our age is junk, is dirt, is wrappers thrown all over the floor, is ugly tinfoil messing up and destroying our oceans and our beauty and our nature. We lack idealism because we favor materialism. We have a spiritual problem. We think that capitalism is premised on this very strange version of the Christian God, where gods put this divine spark inside the world, which are humans, and that's all that matters. And the material world is this thing that you manipulate to serve that divine spark. Whereas the more Catholic, Platonic, and Greek conception of God was similar to this idea that I often talk about. If you look around the world as a musician, you realize that there is an order imprinted in music. No matter what genre of music I play or what song I play, I'm obeying something that is mathematical. And when I obey those mathematics properly, they create beautiful music that gets people to pay attention to me. There is a logos built into music, almost as if God stamped his fingerprint on reality 
He shaped reality a certain way using these principles. These are his tools that he's left for us. And these are our ideals. You know of the golden mean and whatnot. Beautiful girls, beautiful men with their balanced faces, their mathematical golden means. Beautiful nature scenes, beautiful paintings, sculpture, music. It all obeys these principles. Now, our understanding of these principles is slightly different than this conception of our souls all being valuable without our reaching towards these principles. That's an unbelievably big change in perspective. You are not by nature valuable. You have the value where you can try to get better, try to become closer to the principles, try to idealize yourself, but you're not born that way. You are born fallen. You are born incomplete. And you're reaching up towards ideals of beauty, of greatness. You are a work in progress. A consumer is not a finished product. A consumer is not the great challenge and endeavor that all of human history moved towards. The environment and nature and the creation of people out of chaos and the rise of Rome and the creation of the modern world, all of that is not to be sacrificed to your desire to eat stuff and have shiny things. And if you think that's wrong, we are running that experiment now and it is killing people. If we conceptualize God and his fingerprint in the world as there, but we have to seek it, we have to craft ourselves to be closer to it. Just like I, a creator, an artist, when I want to make a song, I have to move it, shape it closer and closer towards the logos of music. None of us are free from that process. What seemed to happen in our collective, and this is what they call the death of God, is we fell out of touch with our idealism. We fell into this very strange materialism. I would uh, like to call it Protestantism as a secret, resentful Irish fuck you to the English. But let's just call it materialism. But if we were to reframe the project of our kingdom, our collective goal, which we have only allowed to be framed unconsciously in the past, if we were to reframe it towards idealism, we would start getting into our heads the first principle that what we're looking for is excellent people who craft themselves into excellent people, institutions that work towards crafting themselves into excellent people so that then the geniuses will come out and be able to create great social programs and do things like socialism in an intelligent way that doesn't destroy the nation and do things intelligent like create great architecture to beautify the place and do things intelligent like figure out economic systems that won't rape the environment and instead offer nations the competitive platform when we can say fine if you want your nationalism you can have it but what that means is that you're in a race to create the greatest examples of your nation your race let's see how well the Irish can compete with their nationalism if the onus is on them to create poets to the standard of Yeats did in the past how would we have to reorganize ourselves then? Nationalism is a weak ideal compared to that. I could see people collectivizing in a very healthy way if that was the attitude. Can we beat the English in the field of literature? That's a test I'd like to try. Now, this is not a political program, nor is it necessarily a alternate to capitalism or whatever is the status quo now. Because if we're working from first principles, we avoid reaction spirals. I see this going on a lot. People don't like capitalism, so they fall into reactionary camps, which have their solutions, but do they address the real problem? Well, that's a difficult question. But see, our simple issue may be that our real problem is so high level that we need to get to that first principle before we can start discussing the, the watered down effects of that. And in some sense, you could see things like capitalism integrating with this in its own unique way. 
And so the collective unconscious is, as I said, those hidden tides that are driving all these current trends that become the talking point of the day. But a very difficult question and profound meditation is to try to take a step back and try to ask yourself, how do I look at the tide? How do I understand what's wrong with the tide? How do I understand how to appease the tide or surf with the tide? Because most are unaware of what is happening at root. They are getting caught up in the waves. And even those who try to look and understand, they barely ever get anything more than a tiny glimpse at the picture. And with the tiny glimpse I've presented, I have a suggestion perhaps a psychological attitude that would immensely help us. But of course, I might be wrong. And so I offer questions you can ask yourself. What is your story? What is your collective? Do you believe that these trends and destinies can be resisted or changed? Or are we fatally heading towards another historical event which always ends in the ideas warring out using us as the cannon fodder. And lastly, if you can change things with a new vision, what would it be?